Okay, morning. So I want to talk about scaling up, uh, and in particular in the context of how engineering comes to play with that kind of idea, because I think it does. Um, and so a good place to start with that is what is it that makes scaling difficult? Uh, and there are a variety of things, I think. Uh, but often, one of the sorts of things that we think about is stuff like this. One of the responses to needing to scale up is to come up with ideas like this, sort of production line style thinking. And there's a fundamental difficulty here because this is not our problem. This is never, ever our problem. This is not even close to our problem with software. And so any idea that's about scaling up like that is wrong. Our problem is very different. So, so we develop software. We, we, we crystallize ideas into a form that can be executed by a computer. And the result of that is a stream of bytes. And one of the things that un is unique about a stream of bytes is that we can reproduce that essentially at zero cost for as many times as we like. So we never have a production problem in the sense of physical things. Our problem is something else. So when we're talking about scaling up, we're not talking about scaling up in the same way as anything else. We're talking about scaling up something very different indeed. And that ought to change the way that we think about it. So th this is not a production scaling problem. So that means applying production line style thinking, which to some degree we're all kind of acclimatized to thinking that way because we grew up in an industrialized, in industrialized societies. We're primed to think that way, but, but that's the wrong way of thinking about this. So Waterfall, for example, is a, is a software production line. Waterfall people even sometimes talk about it that way, which means it's not suitable for software. Doesn't work, has never worked. The only time I've ever seen it work is when people cheated the process. So that's not the right answer. Or any really reproducible, reproducible standardized approach, cookie cutter style approach to developing software. That's not what software is and it's not how it works. So software development, I would argue, is very strongly an exercise in learning, because in whatever context we find ourselves in, we are always creating something for the first time, because otherwise we'd create it for free from what we had before, because production is free for us. So we're always doing something new. It might not be new in the world, it might only be new in our context, in our team, but it's always new. And that means it's always about learning and discovery. There's another aspect to software development that's certainly an increasing part of our daily lives, which is that we build systems that are much more complicated than any human being can hold in their entirety in their heads and understand every ramification of them. And so in order to be able to deal with that, we've got to also worry about managing the complexity of the systems that we build. And there are tools for us to be able to do that, mental tools that we need to apply. To be, to be able to do those sorts of things. So how do we scale those kinds of things, those kinds of activities? How do we scale learning, and how do we scale managing complexity? It's not an easy question to answer. Sorry, I'll just move my cursor off the screen a little bit. That's better. I've got ten, ten things, five in each category, that, that will help us to do these things. And Certainly, for, for people here at, the, at an Agile conference, you're going to recognize many of these things, particularly on this side, which is Agile is fundamentally about learning. So iteration, feedback, incremental development, evolving our system step by step, working experimentally, learning and inspecting and adapting, but being empirical, learning from production and, and, and changing our behaviors from there. Those are all at the heart of what real agility means. You can do all of these things without big ceremonies or anything this, and, and, and if you're doing these things, you're definitely being agile. If you're doing the ceremonies without those things, you're not being agile. These are at the core of what it is that it takes to be able to, to, to really um, learn and be, be good at it. And then we need to um, optimize to manage complexity. We need ideas like modularity, cohesion, separation of concerns, 
reducing coupling, abstraction, so that we're able to make changes in one part of a system without worrying about what's going on in another part of a system. That allows us to move more quickly. Now, the problem here, when we're talking about scaling, is that information is a kind of slippery idea. The, the, there's information in our organization and the way that our teams interact with one another. And the problems are the same. The problems that I've just described in terms of managing complexity are really fundamental to inf information. They're not really about any particular technology or even software in general. They're true about us as well. A team is an information system, and the ways that teams interact with one another have the same kind of problems of concurrency and coupling and so on. And we need to deal with those if we want to do things at, sc at scale. One of the difficulties is that, and, and this is always an increasing difficulty as we start to scale up software beyond a certain size, is that dependencies really don't scale very well at all. Uh, the, this, the, as, as our systems get bigger and bigger, the smallest change can have a disastrous effect. And so in order to be able to scale software development, we need to find ways of limiting the impact of these kinds of changes. So, what must we do? We need to think about and recognize that software is a creative discipline. It's a discipline that's founded around exploration and learning, and we need to optimize for that. Dependencies in code and in organizations are caustic, but they are also unavoidable. If we need two parts of a system, whether it's a human system or a software system, to interact in some way, there's going to be coupling between them to some degree. And so we've got to figure out how we're going to manage that, how we're going to deal with that. And so in order to grow our ability to create software, we need to apply creative, I would argue, engineering style thinking to managing those sorts of problems. So here are a few principles that, that seem to me to be to be relevant here. So I've already mentioned a couple. We need to optimize for learning and for managing complexity. And as part of that, in, for both of those things, it's absolutely essential that we control the variables, that we're able to try things out and control the variables sufficiently so that we know what are the result of our experiments are. If I make a change to my software, in the hope that it's going to win more, win more sign-ups from users, and you make a change to the software which accidentally wins more sign-ups from users, how do I know the impact of my change? How do I control the variables so that I can see the impact of my change and not yours? One way in which I could do that is I could work in smaller steps, release more frequently, and I'm more likely to be releasing my change separately from yours then, and I'll be able to see the impact. But there are many ways in which controlling the variables matter. If we're writing a test, how do we know that the results of the tests are repeatable and reliable? By controlling the variables, putting the system into a state that we want it to be in, and so on. We want to get to the point where we can make more evidence-based decisions. That means that we need to start thinking and working more experimentally. The previous speaker was talking about um, trying ideas and learning from those ideas and, try and be willing to be wrong. That's fundamental to learning, and that must be part of what it is that we do. The way that I, I, I phrase it slightly differently, but the idea is the same, I, I suggest that the, the, the granddaddy of learning is science. And so we can learn lessons from science and we can apply those. That's why I call this engineering. It's kind of a practical form of scientific style reasoning. But one of the deep philosophical ideas of science is that we're going to start out assuming that our ideas are wrong, not that they're right. And then we're going to try and figure out how we learn where they're wrong and how they're wrong and how we can improve them. That's a much better way of learning than assuming that we're right and trying to prove that we're right, it turns out. So never assuming that we're starting off with the right answer is probably a good starting place. Then we find ways to falsify our ideas. How would we show that we were wrong? That's a better, stronger proof than trying to prove that we're right. I can assert that all swans are white, and I can never prove it. 
But as soon as I see one black swan, I know that all swans aren't white, and that's falsification at work. It's a stronger statement. And this is one of the lessons that we learn from science. The other aspect of scaling and dealing with uh, uh, taking this more engineering approach to thinking about this kind of thing is to check where we are all the time in our progress, have kind of essentially real-time monitors of where we are in, in, in our progress, in, in, our, in our, the safety of our changes, and so on. So, I, I've kind of led up to, I suppose, asking this question. What is it that you think of when you hear the phrase continuous delivery? I suppose I'm one of the people that's responsible for helping to popularize this as a term and as an idea. Uh, although I'm not the originator of the term, and neither is Jez, continuous delivery is, was, is one of the first principles of the Agile Manifesto as an idea. But optimizing for continuous delivery is um, really what Jez and I were talking about when we wrote about it in our book of the same name. You might be thinking of stuff like build automation, and you'd be right, that's part of it. Deployment automation, DevOps, Deployment pipelines, always deploying to production, maybe sometimes. Automated testing, for sure. I'd use this as a definition, though. None of those things are definitional. All of those things are activities that we might undertake to achieve continuous delivery, but I'd say that this is, this is part of the definition. Working so that our software is always in a releasable state. And we want to try and keep it in a releasable state for as much of the time as we possibly can. That's a big idea, and it's a challenging idea, and it goes to the heart of w pointing out where scaling is difficult. I'll try and point out what I mean by that. But let's start with the words. Always, always in a releasable state. Always sounds quite difficult. So how do we do that kind of thing? Well, we optimize for, sorry, let me just step back. Optimized for fast feedback. I pressed it again twice. <laughs> the delays are wrong on that slide. Optimized for fast feedback, frequent fee feedback on the releasability of our systems. We want to try and get our system into a releasable state after each small change and evaluate that. That's at the heart of continuous delivery thinking. And we want to do that all of the time, as frequently as we can possibly achieve. Releasability it determines the boundaries of scalability. If we can work so that our system that we are working on, whatever it is, is releasable by definition, then we're in a good state. It's tested as thoroughly as we're going to test it before we release it, because now it's releasable. That would be silly to retest it more after that. So it's ready to go at that point. So this starts to put a boundary on how scalable we can go. One of the ways in which practically we can see the impact of that is through building deployment pipelines. A deployment pipeline is an automated mechanism to assert and define the releasability of our system. We're going to build an, as, as automated as possible evaluation of our system as, so that we can make a change, get feedback on our change, and understand how it stands in terms of its releasability. Um, I can say this with more um, assert assertive, uh, more assurance than I can say most things that I say because I'm the person that invented the term deployment pipeline. A deployment pipeline goes from commit to releasable outcome. If you have a deployment pipeline that goes to something else, it's not a deployment pipeline. It's about getting to releasability. It's about being definitive for releasability. That's kind of at the core of the idea. This means, if we have this feedback, that we can be confident uh, in, uh, to make progress. We can gain confidence by testing our system very thoroughly within the bounds of the deployment pipeline. And testing thoroughly in this context largely means automated testing, because we can test it many more times than any army of people can do. Um, and I genuinely think that this is real software engineering. This is part of an engineering discipline. 
And I, I find it hard to imagine how you can count it as engineering if you're not doing this kind of level of testing, really. This gives us, this gives us a huge in, um, step forward in our confidence of our systems and our ability to release them safely. So what does it take to be confident? Well, here's my deployment pipeline again. And first, we want to make sure that our tests pass locally. That's going to be the fastest feedback that we can get as part of the development process. Then we want to know that the code does what the developers think it's doing, verifying those. This catches about, research says this catches about 58% of production failures, just that style of testing. Then we want to test, verify that it does what the users want it to do. We want to evaluate it in lifelike scenarios, in production-like test environments to get feedback on that. And then we like, may want to check that it's nice to use with human beings, not regression testing, exploratory testing to try and learn just how it is that this, how the system is to use as it's being developed, not afterwards. And then maybe is it fast enough? Is it resilient enough? Is it scalable enough? Is it secure? Whatever it is that determines in our context releasability. Is it regulatory compliant perhaps? Uh, I've built pipelines with all of these checks in at some point. At that point, if all of those things have been determined by the pipeline, we can be confident in releasing it into production. It's a releasable change. In terms of what do we mean by um, fast feedback, which I said earlier, well, for the first part, the development-focused part, I recommend that you aim for a target of feedback in under five minutes. And for the whole thing, to determine the releasability, I, aim that you, I suggest that you aim for a target of under an hour. That may sound extravagant, but people have done this with highly complicated systems, highly complex systems, um, and very, very large systems too. One example is a company that I worked at. We built a financial exchange, and just to put this into context of how many tests, we'd be running hundreds of tests before a commit, about 35,000 commit stage tests under five minutes, about 20,000 acceptance test user scenarios, and that was exploratory, and then there hundreds of performance tests, and we, re we recorded the worst hour of our system in production and replayed it at five times load, and, and these kinds of things, and then thousands of other kinds of tests. So there's a lot of testing going on as part of this effort. But this is what it takes to get to releasable and getting re to a releasable state in under an hour, ideally. If this were real engineering, though, it would improve the efficiency and the quality of our work. And the data says it does both. The data says that if you can get this kind of picture at the kinds of speeds that I'm talking about, the people that are working on it will have more fun, there'll be less burnout, they'll enjoy their jobs more, they'll be more committed to the organizations that they work for. The development approach will be more scalable within the context of these things, and we'll talk about the reasons for that in, a, in just a sec. Uh, but also the businesses that we're working in will make more money, users will be more happy, the software will be more stable. I use a tagline for my business, which is better software faster. And that's not a idle promise, that's what the data says. If you read the DORA report, the State of DevOps reports, the, Dora, the writings about DORA, uh, Google, and the Accelerate book, this backs this up with some evidence that says that this is a better way of working. When we're talking about releasability, strictly, if I'm being very pedantic, deployability is really what I mean. Because what I want to be able to do is I want to do a small drip of changes that may not yet add up to a whole feature, and, but I'm going to end up releasing those into, into production. Um, and this is a tool that we can use to, to um, define the scope of evaluation. Because I'm going to evaluate my change to the point of its releasability. That means I must be releasing evaluating a releasable unit of software. If at the conclusion of my deployment pipeline, I now say, oh, I've got to go and test that with these other services over here before I'm happy to re release it, it's not a deployment pipeline. What this means is um, if we're going from commit to releasable outcome in this way, then 
That's the scope of version control. That's the scope of the deployment pipeline. That's the scope of release. And so we've got a concrete reason, what, what, you know, how to apply that scope, what, what, what that scope means in the context of continuous delivery. It means that there's no more testing to be done at the end of the pipeline transit, no sign-offs, no integration tests with other components of the system. Th there are two ways in which we can scale this. We can either grow the pipeline um, and invest in the engineering that's necessary to get answers quickly enough from it, or we can decompose our system into a collection of independently deployable pieces, each of which we're comfortable to deploy without testing alongside the other pieces. That's the real definition of microservices. It's not what most people that practice microservices think microservices are very often, but that's what is in the definition. Microservices is an organiza organizational scalability play. It's the most scalable way of building software, but it does this as a cost. This is a more difficult way of doing things because now we've got to be able to design pieces of a system that talk to each other, but that we can release wholly independently of one another in order to gain the benefits of microservices and the scalability. Oops. It's a new presentation, and I've got two versions of the slide. Sorry about that. So in software, though, scaling is more complicated than it seems. And one of the ways in which it's more complicated is um, it's really this. We can scale the size and complexity of the systems that we create, and what most people think is that that means that we can scale the size of our organizations to create things more quickly. And we've known for a very long time that that's a really, really slippery slope. As we've just seen with microservices, it's possible, but it comes at a cost in terms of complexity, operational complexity, development complexity, architectural complexity. To coin a phrase uh, for, by the uh, recently deceased Fred Brooks, a, 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 a genius of our, of our discipline, you can't make a baby in a month with nine women. There are some kinds of problems that have a fixed period of time, a fixed amount of effort. You can't you, you can't scale up by just throwing people at a problem. And in software, this is, a, this is a very, very fragile thing. I like this piece of metadata research. Um, it's not deeply academic, but they, they analyze the results of 4,000 different software projects of all different kinds and sizes. They divided the projects up into teams of five people and fewer, and of 20 people and more. And then they measured two things. First, they measured how long it took each team to get to 100,000 lines of code. As you might guess, on average, the teams of 20 people beat the teams of five people. But on average, it took all of the teams about nine months to get to 100,000 lines of code. And the teams of 20 people, on average, beat the teams of five people, on average, by one week in nine months. So on average, a people working in a team of five are nearly but not quite four times as productive as teams working in a team of 20. Small teams matter. Small teams are deeply important if we want to do good work in terms of software. And that's about learning and about managing the complexity and those sorts of things. The other measure that they did, incidentally, was that they also looked at um, and the number of defects that were, that, that were created, and the teams of 20 people and more created five times as many defects as the teams of five. This gets us into ideas of, like, organizational scaling. And... This is, a, this is an idea that, that I learned of from my friend James Lewis of ThoughtWorks, who got really interested in a field called nonlinear dynamics and complexity theory. theory. And this, this comes from there. So the traditional way of scaling an organization is something like that. You build sort of a hierarchy, and you have you know, bosses, and you have 
you know, teams of other bosses and you have hierarchies of bosses until you get down to the bottom of people that do the work. Um, now, the interesting thing is that there's some maths around this. These kinds of structures appear all over the place. And the maths is about the scalability of these kinds of structures, these kinds of informational structures, is interesting. If you look at this for, for these sorts of um, directed graphs uh, of, of information, people, resources, whatever, there's this number that keeps cropping up, 0.85. If you have um, a team, a, an organization, a company that's structured like this, and it doubles in size, its productivity, its capacity, its profitability will go up by 85%. It won't double. There's a, there's a loss each time it scales. The flip side is, is if you've got a team like this, then... Um, if you, if you double in size, you only have to pay 85% in terms of infrastructure costs to, get, to, 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 to keep it going. And this kind of crops up all of the time. Double the headcount, revenue increases by 85%. There's another way of organizing things, though, if you've got this. And this is this kind of loosely coupled sort of social network um, linked graph kind of approach. Um, this is the microservices team approach. This is the dividing the problem up into a series of small independent teams who make progress um, independently of one another. These are more autonomous. These, this, the number here is 1.15. This is what Amazon does. And the scary thing about this is that when Amazon doubles in headcount, they more than double in profitability. That explains their explosive growth. And, and th this was a conscious choice. Interestingly, Jeff Bezos is one of the, the funders of the Santa Fe Institute of nonlinear, uh, nonlinear dynamics research that's going on there. So he knew about this when he kind of came up with the, with the idea of this famous idea of two pizza teams and how that scales better. Now, there's a cost to this. There's a problem with this because what you do is that you trade off um, consistency, uh, coordination for scale, scalability. You want these teams to be more independent. You want them to be uh, in control of their own choices, their own destiny in order for this to work. If you want to t be able to tell them what to do and apply more constraints to them, it breaks this model and you end up more like this model and your scalability factor changes. It's a choice. You can do either one. But there's more limits on this one, but some advantages. And there are fewer limits on this one and some are disadvantages. <clears throat> so that's kind of the, the picture on the right is, is Amazon and the picture on the left is kind of nearly everybody else. Um, So, to scale up, problem solving needs to be distributed. That's how we get to scale up. To scale up, what we need then are strong, motivated, autonomous teams. We need teams to take responsibility. This is borne out in the research done by the State of DevOps people. The, their data says one of the strongest predictors of high scores in stability, which measures the quality of the work that we produce, and throughput, the rate at which we can produce work of that quality, um, the highest predictor is the team's ability to make its own decisions. It can make progress without coordinating its work or asking permission from anybody outside of the team. So those are very different kind of teams to what often we see in organizations. So what does this look like in an organization? How do we think about all, managing such teams? And, and I, I, this, is, this is taken from somebody else's work too, so this is from Gr uh, Gregor Hope, um, and this is his advice of the way of thinking about 
um, leading autonomous teams. So the autonomous team is responsible for nearly all of their work. They're, near, they're responsible for making progress independently of other teams. So first, we've got to find a way of carving up the problem in a way that we can give them that autonomy. And then we've got to leave them to it. We've got to let them do the work, experience the problem. They're in the work, so they're going to be best placed to see any problems with that way of working and improve those things. But to do that, we've got to give them some direction. So leadership in this context is not about telling people what to do. It's rather about defining the strategic event. It's about defining the boundaries within which their autonomy can, autonomy can, can exist and that they can make progress. But we also probably need to support those. There's a, I think one of the most important books of the, the last few years is the Team Topologies book. And in the Team Topologies book, they you talk about using team structure as a tool to better organize software development. Um, and they talk about four different types of teams. Um, the core are, is what are called stream-aligned teams. Those are the teams that are building the software that people want, want, that they're solving problems for our users that the users care about. And then you have platform teams, enabling teams, and complex subsystem teams who support those. And the idea of these other forms of teams is to reduce the cognitive load within the stream-aligned teams so that the stream-aligned teams can can stay focused on the stuff that really matters, the outcomes that, that, we're, that we're shooting for. So the idea is that we you define tactics, common tools, common patterns, those sorts of things to support the work of the stream-aligned teams and allow them to make progress independently of one another. So the first part is really about setting the goal. Leadership is about sort of planting a flag on a hill and saying, wouldn't, let's, let's, wouldn't it be great if we could go over here? You know, imagine how wonderful it would be if we could do these things. That's it. It's not about how they get there. The job of the team is to figure out how they get there. So the job of the team is to do the work and all of the work to make, to, 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 to make something that is genuine releasable. And then the idea of everybody else is to support their ability to do that work and to maximize their ability to move quickly and, 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 and deliver changes that users, outcomes that users really want. There are some techniques that we can use to try and breed this sort of autonomy in teams. I would say that this, is, this autonomy it doesn't really matter whether you're talking about the distributed graph kind of thing or the hierarchy kind of model. This is still the best model for software development. This is going to optimize us to allow us to solve hard problems within teams without relying on co coordination. If you go back to what I said earlier on, this is a way of reducing the coupling between teams, aiming for these autonomous teams and allowing them more independence and they, they can move at their own pace rather than being held back by other groups of people. So some of the techniques for breeding this kind of autonomy are um, goal or mission-based planning. What I've just said, really. Would, let, wouldn't it be great if we could do this fundamentally focusing on the outcomes rather than the techniques that we use to get there? It's called mission-based planning because this is a lesson that the military learned a long time ago for teams senior officers don't say, go down this road, turn left through that gate, climb up that road, and then shoot those people. They say, take that hill. Sorry about the warlike reference. But, but mission-based planning is kind of a, a way of maximizing the effectiveness of people. You want the people to understand the problem and then figure out their own solutions to that problem. So the other part of this is to define simple, well-understood constraints. We'd like people on these teams to understand what the goals are, understand what the guidelines are for the organization, understand what, where they can compromise, where they can't, understand what, is, what are the parameters for their, their autonomy. You can't just go to a bunch of people that are used to working in a more traditional setting and say, you're all autonomous now. Because they'll sit there and they'll go, yeah, really. I know you don't really mean that. 
If I'm autonomous, I'm going to increase my salary to three million pounds. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. So you've got to say what the boundaries are. You've got to help people understand and allow them to genuinely be autonomous, but within some constraints. So setting some guidelines is a good idea. The other key part here is what I mentioned earlier, to manage the cognitive load of the team. Allow them to be able to make progress on the things that matter to their users and take away work, you know, de develop supporting technology, practices, processes, whatever it is that help that team make progress but don't get in their way. The job of a platform is not to come up with some beautiful ivory tower solution that nobody understands. It's to service those teams. It's a service function. Teams understand that need to understand the problem that they're working on. One of the things, I, I work as a consultant, and I usually work in larger organizations, and one of the things that I see all of the time, the anti-pattern that I see all of the time, is something that I call programming by remote control, using the requirements process to tell people what to do. The commonest form of this is having a UI team that define what, exactly what the UI leaves, and that's given as a requirement to be handed into um, the development team. Defining the UI is part of the development. Somebody might come up with a better idea than a bunch of people doing that, and somebody might find out that, there's, that, that, that that idea doesn't work very well and need to change it. Putting that responsibility into the autonomous team is part of this. And to do that, the teams need to understand the goals and so on, but deeply understand um, the problem that they're working on. And they need to own the problem that they're working on. Again, the previous speaker was talking about um, teams that were interested in going out and discovering um, the, pro the details of the problem, talking to real users and so on. This is something that we tend to have lost sight of a little, even within agile teams. But understanding the problem and the ownership of the problem is a, a core of being able to do a good job, it seems to me. I just want to give you a simple example, really. This is in terms of architecture, because I'm a technical nerd, and that's why I kind of think, think about things. But one of the ways in which you can kind of constrain things is with architecture. And one of the ways that I think of architecture is not as a prescriptive thing that tells you exactly what your answers must be, but more like a tourist map. So you want an architecture that kind of gives you a rough guideline of where stuff goes and, and the context of where the thing that you're working on is and how it sits. I use the, these sorts of things. This is, these, are, these are things that I call whiteboard models. And they're called whiteboard models where they're kind of a consensus of the architecture for, for a team. And any, at least any senior member of the team is able to draw this from memory on a whiteboard. That puts a limit to how complicated and how detailed it can be. Because you should be able to do this even for a big system. But it's enough for you. Oh, the reason I call it a tourist map is it's like if you go to the zoo and you want to know where the gorillas are. You can kind of follow, the, you know, follow the, the path, even though it's not geographically accurate. These, kinds of, these kind of maps allow us to have conversations about how software works together without worrying too much about detail. These are useful tools that allow us to move forwards. Growing the responsibility and ownership in the team, the best tool for this is ensemble programming. Mob programming or pair programming, I'm an old school extreme programmer. I'm, I'm a believer in pair programming. Mob programming is fantastic too, though. I've, I have had an opportunity to try it. But the idea is, is that we get to learn from one another. It's the best tool to help us lever up the, the, the culture in a team and the ownership and the sense of responsibility for the things that we're working on and the understanding. And actually, pair nearly everything, not just pair programming. We want people to be creative, and to do that, people are that they're most creative when they're working together on things, talking about things, learning from one another, all of the time. So we don't need to formalize that kind of training other than trying to encourage people to work together. I would argue that the primary role of leadership um, is to teach, not to command. The goal is to help people do the best that they can with their skills, their understanding, their talents, 
maybe plant the flag that I was talking about before, but it's not to say you must write this code like this. You, this is your software. So this is the solution that you must abide by. We scale decision making by making it pervasive, distributed, and continuous. If you've got to go and ask permission from some, someone three layers up in the management hierarchy in your organization to do something, that doesn't scale very well. That person is a bottleneck. Your feedback, your feedback loop is too long. And we scale implementation by optimizing for fast feedback on releasability. If we can do both of these things, that gives us an opportunity. And if you look at the organizations that we think of as being good at this kind of thing, able to operate at big scale, they do both of these things. Thank you very much. That's the end of my talk. I hope I've, I hope I've got a few minutes for questions. Anybody? No. Oh. Yep. There's somebody at the back. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah. So it was amazing uh, presentation. Thank you for this. So uh, my question is related to the latest trend. What we are currently looking at, let's say U.S. market or a European market or let's say world market, where uh, earlier we used to think from a technology point of view, uh, everybody's dream used to be Mang, M W A N G companies. But I believe if you really see today's trend from past one or two months. I believe these five are the main companies which are basically coming down on their kind of like budgets, number of people who is employed. Uh, do you really think the model you just uh, demoed right now, let's say with respect to say Amazon, is there any step which they are trying to take back with respect to thing which has backfired to them, telling that why are they kind of like, you know, going for something like 20,000, 30,000 people cut down in there? Is it because of overestimation? or something like overconfidence with respect to their own uh, decision making? Uh, so I, 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 if you're asking does this really scale, this approach, I think this is the only way that really scales, the, the, certainly the, the distributed approach. The, the, the trade-off there, as I said, is that you kind of lose consistency to some degree. But it's the fastest, it's the fastest, way, it's the fastest way of scaling. Amazon, for example, that, that they have tens of thousands of developers and they are releasing change all of the time. It's been a few years since I looked, but the last time I looked, the, the, the number of changes to, of the number of new services introduced on AWS in one year, a couple of years ago, was, was about 2,000 changes. And there were overlaps, there, were, there was redundancy in those sorts of things because the teams were working independently of one another. Um, the, if you work to try and keep things together and, and to, to develop in, you know, in, in concert and, and, and rely on evaluating everything together, that is possible. Ultimately, it's less scalable, but then you've got to do the kind of engineering that I was talking about of getting the feedback. Tesla is quite a good example of that. They've actually got relatively few people working in software development at Tesla. But they, they work very quickly. They're a continuous delivery company. They get very fast feedback on the, the system as a whole. And they can make a change. They can make a change to a car that results in the production line churning out the new to design of the car in under three hours. Um, so this, this is the kind of thing that we're talking about. Does this scale? Yes. If you're, if, I didn't get all of your question. I'm sorry. But if you're talking about the distributed teams, then more autonomy is better. If people are trying to do command and control across time zones, that's probably the worst of all worlds in terms of the organizational structure because there are, then the people that are making the changes are going to see problems and they're not going to be able to solve those problems without going back to people that are somewhere else and don't understand the, the detail of the problem. So you need the people that are in the work making some of these decisions and I think that's a deeply agile way of thinking personally. I'm not, and now I'm not entirely sure whether I've answered your question. Yeah, definitely, yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi. 
this idea of uh, having the problem distributed is interesting, but I would like to more, uh, know more on how to make it possible. Because the reason is that usually the organization structure is more of a, a top-down approach where we get a larger problem and define some strategy to solve it. And that's the way it's flowing top to bottom. So how to so, make it So possible? how you go about it is it depends on which route you take to some degree. So are you going to build? So, so the first thing I would say is if you're looking at kind of continuous delivery as part of the solution, and I think it is, mm -hmm. then um, the simplest way to do that is that you build everything together and evaluate everything together and release everything together. Doesn't mean your system can't be nicely modular, nicely service oriented, all of those things. But if that's your scope of evaluation, that's the simplest way of managing the dependencies between things and reducing the coupling. You, so that's a world of continuous integration, shared code ownership, very fast feedback, and lots of engineering to get that fast feedback. Um, that's one way of doing things at the technical level. The, um, the, the microservices approach, the, other, the, the things to be doing then are thinking about um, contract-based testing, uh, ports and adapters, architectural patterns at the technical level. But both of these, the, those, the technical things aren't really the stumbling blocks for either of those. The, the one big system is remarkably more scalable than you think. Yeah. Um, it can work for literally tens of thousands of developers in a single repository if you want it to. Um, but you have to invest the engineering. But the real hard part is, can, is getting people to start thinking differently. I think that what we're talking about here with modern software engineering techniques modern leading edge of agile is a paradigm shift in thinking for software development and the trouble with a paradigm shift is it's going to simplify things maybe in the new paradigm and the picture's better in the new paradigm but it means that some of the questions from the old paradigm don't make sense anymore and they're not answerable and so trying to convince people maybe non-technical people in your organization to adopt these changes is the really hard part the technicalities of it I think are reasonably well understood. I don't, you know, they're not spread all around the world, but you know, I can point to people that know how to answer those problems. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that how you translate that in your organization is a much more difficult cultural thing. As a result of that, I, you know, one of the downsides of continuous delivery, it's very hard to adopt. It's better than anything else that we know how to do. I think that's a, I don't think that's hype, hyperbole on my part. I don't think that's hubris on my part. I think that's backed up by the evidence. But it's, in, it's very difficult to adopt. And that's a shame, because it works better. So if you're starting from a startup, start with continuous delivery, because that's the easiest time to start. But if you're trying to retrofit this to a, an organization, you're going to have a long journey. I usually say to my clients, it's going to pro you know, if you're in a normal starting pace, Forgive me, if you're kind of in the, in the realm of sort of flaccid scrum, not really very good agile, if you're in that kind of place, it's probably going to take you two or three years before you're good at continuous delivery. But the good news is that it's only going to be a month or two before you're at least as good as you were before, and from then on, you'll be getting better and better and better. So it's a difficult change to make, always. And there's an awful lot to it. It covers a lot of territory. Thank you. Hi. Um, the LMAX slide you showed, so which is like the cycle of tests in yep. each. Yeah. So in that, I have a curiosity question about like the local and dev environment. You said that's going to be like hundreds of tests. And in the UAT, it's going to be 20,000 plus tests. So it's probably going to be an automated test, right? Yes. So Virtually all of the tests with numbers were automated tests. Okay, so what, what kind of uh, tools uh, that has been used for making it uh, work? Uh, mostly, uh, it was JUnit. Okay. And then stuff that we wrote. Okay. The, the technique for the acceptance tests is, um, is, is based around building domain-specific languages to evaluate the releasable unit of software for our system and those sorts of things. So there's a structured way of building those kinds of tests, which drives the development process and helps development teams to understand the, the outcome that they're striving to achieve as part, of the, as part of the requirements process. So we build these things called executable specifications that define the target outcome. So there are some technicalities to it, but the technology itself 
doesn't really matter. You can do it with almost anything. So it's going to be mostly of microservices related tests and not based on UI, right? That's all no, the... they, were, they were UI based tests UI -based. as well. Yeah. Oh, so no. so, we, so we, we, we hid that. The test cases themselves didn't know anything about that. That's a testing technique. If you want to learn more, check out my YouTube channel. There's some, 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 some examples on there. Uh, but in the plumbing of our testing at LMAX, we were using Selenium to actually talk to, to web-based interfaces, for example. And we would use other technologies here and there. But it doesn't really matter what, which ones you pick. OK, so in this case, like, what would be the sprint timeline you guys have to make this process end-to-end -end cycle? Depends what you mean. So we built the first version of the pipeline in the first iteration of the project. So it took two weeks to have the first working version of a pipeline. It wasn't as sophisticated as the picture that I showed you. That evolved over time as need demanded it to evolve. So the easiest time to start is right at the start with the first features that you write. You start writing some tests. You build a deployment pipeline to execute those tests. You deploy the results of your work, even though that doesn't make any sense for users yet. But if you build that then, it's then easy to add to in future. If you wait until you're nearly finished and then build it, it's hard. OK. OK. And uh, you showed a slide for the distributed uh, pipelines and scale pipeline. Uh -huh. So I wanted to know, uh, in the distributed pipeline, the merging and integration testing grows high, isn't it? Is it going to be the difficulty, or you so, feel so, so, so we didn't, we didn't, we didn't do S, um, we didn't do integration testing as part of our strategy. We did it occasionally. Um, but um, I think you need to stop, because I'm going to have to put, charge a consultancy rate soon. <laughs> but um, th there's, there's a lot more stuff uh, on this uh, on, my, on my, uh, my YouTube channel. So do check it out. There's a playlist that's about acceptance testing. Thank you. Pleasure. There's somebody over here. Ah. Hi, Dave. Um, I'm a believer and a promoter of continuous integration, continuous delivery deployment, so I relate to what you say very easily. And thanks for all the work that you're doing in this space. Thank you. Um, there's one point uh, what I have seen is that whenever we talk about continuous delivery, it's uh, primarily around engineering, the tools, the automation. It starts when the coding gets, code gets committed. That is when it begins and it ends when we deploy it in an environment, right? Now, in this entire process, to be truly, to imagine that my product gets to the production on a regular basis, there has to be also a mindset of identifying the change in the right granularity or the right sizing. And if that is not done, or if this entire um, impact of the change in the production in my software if that is not being identified in the right pattern, then this is not possible. I mean, the code won't get. I mean, if, I, if we start, continue to create monster epics that continues for four sprints, three sprints, we won't be able to release it. Uh. So that part is not in the pipeline, neither it is the engineering aspect. There are a lot of sessions like feature mapping sessions or discussions that are happening, right? Yes. But that part doesn't get of often covered when people speak about continuous delivery. Do you think I, I, I should... do agree, and I also, I also think that continuous delivery is, is wider than just deployment pipelines. The trouble is, is that deployment pipelines are the easy part to talk about. <laughs> so, so I have a training course, for example, that does exactly what you're talking about. It's, it talks about stories to executable specifications. So how, how do you identify the ideas? How do you analyze the ideas? How do you get those to the point of being executable specifications? And I think that's part of the engineering discipline as well. Um, but it doesn't often get talked about. I, I, th I think it's most often discussed in the context of domain-driven design and behavior-driven development. And those are fantastic tools. I think of those as tools that are part of the continuous delivery process for the reasons that you just described. Um, but, um, but you're right, they, they tend to get talked about separately. Um, the deployment pipeline isn't all there is. There's more to it than that. Um, the, I think the best way to think about continuous delivery is working so our software is always in a releasable state. But that's also about more than just the pipeline. That's about 
thinking about what's coming next, thinking about the things that are out in the, in the wild mean, determining what's, what, what's going to come next, and so on. It's a, it's a, the whole thing is a feedback loop that we need to optimize for. I do talk about that in other contexts. So once again, forgive me advertising, but my YouTube channel has some stuff on, that, on, on those things too. Thank you. Uh, one last question, Dave. Yeah. You said uh, we need to think of software as a creative discipline. Yes. Whereas I've heard terms like factory model, industrialization of yeah. software. So these seem to be as, at odds with each other. I think they are at odds. I think that calling, to, calling for a factory model or industrialization, it can only be from people that don't know anything about software because it's not how it works. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Dave. Thank you very much.